Okay, Nutrition 111 students, let's talk about proteins. There we go. And here we go. Again, we will be focusing on type and source when we talk about proteins and health, but there's a whole lot to talk about first. This is a quick overview of protein, and you certainly know this because you've taken um, anatomy and physiology. Protein is an essential nutrient, not only because it makes up structures of our body, but also uh, for other roles as well, which we will discuss. Amino acids are the building blocks of protein. Nine of these are essential, which means you must get them from your diet because your body cannot synthesize them and 11 are non-essential. They can be synthesized in the body as long as you have the building blocks, which include nitrogen. Let me note here that Protein um, sits apart from carbohydrate and lipids in the fact that it does contain nitrogen, which is not found in carbohydrates and lipids. Now, we talked about the fact that there are nine essential amino acids. There are also some that are termed conditionally essential, which means in some conditions they become essential. And tyrosine is conditionally essential in the case of the genetic disease PKU, because in that disease, the individual has a limited ability to convert phenylalanine to tyrosine and therefore tyrosine becomes essential. This diet is tested for at birth and very important that it is because detection enables this infant to be placed on the proper diet, which will preserve brain function. You've discussed, you've studied protein synthesis extensively. I did wanna mention as we look at this um, image that dietary proteins are not used in the body as intact proteins. They are digested down to the amino acids and then the amino acids become part of the amino acid pool for building your own body proteins, which are dictated by your DNA, of course. So what's important is that the amino acid pool has the right mix of amino acids so that that protein building can continue uninterrupted. Protein structure is, is fairly complex. It's more than just that primary structure, which is the linking together of these amino acids to a long amino acid chain, a chain 100 to 300 amino acids long. That sequence is dictated, of course, by our DNA, but that sequence of amino acid also then directs the folding and the possible um, attraction of one chain to another for the final protein structure. So in a way, DNA dictates sequence, sequence determines form, and form, as we see, determines function. Sickle cell disease is a, an example of how important the sequence of amino acids is, because there's one error in the amino acid chain for hemoglobin and sickle cell anemia. And because of what that one error, the shape of hemoglobin, especially under low oxygen conditions, becomes elongated instead of disc shape. And there they stick into the tiny capillaries and cause pain and discomfort and lack of oxygen delivery. So one amino acid sequencing error causes this change in this vital protein. Let's take a listen. In people with sickle cell disease, their red blood cells become deformed turning sickle-shaped. The bone marrow tries to make more red cells to make up for the loss, but can't keep up, 
causing anemia. Their new shape keeps them from moving properly through the body, and the misshapen cells can jam up and stick to the walls of the blood vessels. These clumps cut off oxygen to healthy tissue, delaying a child's normal growth and causing fatigue and extreme pain. Okay. Sickle cell disease is something that I'm sure you will see in your um, professional careers. Tremendous pain um, is part of this disease, even though we've had made some progress in, in treating um, that pain, pain management. Okay, sorry for another uh, video so quickly, but I wanted to use this not only to review the structure of proteins, but also to talk about protein denaturation. And I'll follow up with a few comments. For hundreds of great shows like this one, go to onnetworks.com. Hi, I'm Dr. Kiki Sanford, and today on Food Science, we're breaking down proteins. One of the most important processes in cooking is protein denaturation, or the breaking of a protein structure by the application of extreme conditions. Denaturation changes the structure of proteins and therefore the way that they react. Without denaturation, many delicious foods would never be possible. Proteins are necessary for our survival. We have to eat them to be able to create them in our own bodies. And to proteins, structure is everything. From their most basic to complex levels, structure determines the function of proteins. Many of the foods we eat contain proteins, which consist of amino acids. There are hundreds of amino acids found throughout nature, but only instructions for 20 are contained in our genetic code. The amino acids that organisms can biosynthesize differ. Some amino acids must be provided by diet. These are called essential amino acids. Proteins are created by connecting amino acids end to end, like the links in a chain. Then chemical interactions and bonds within the chain cause proteins to fold into knot-like formations. Proteins have four structural levels. The primary, chain of amino acids. Secondary is the formation of patterns within the protein. Tertiary are side chain interactions leading to the stability of single protein molecules. And quaternary is the association of multiple protein molecules or subunits. So in uncooked foods, proteins are normally all folded up. There are an almost infinite number of possible protein structures, but the primary structure determines the final folded shape that allows a protein to perform a particular task. Change the amino acid sequence even slightly, and it might affect the structure enough to create a new protein with an entirely different function. There are different methods that can be used to break the bonds in proteins and change them from their naturally folded state, like heat or acid or force. Heating proteins increases the kinetic energy or energy of motion within them so that they start vibrating more and more intensely. The amount of heat determines the amount of motion. More heat, more motion. Eventually, if enough heat is applied, the molecular motion will cause the bonds that keep the proteins folded to break. The knots unfurl and the proteins denature, returning to their primary chain-like structure. Our bodies use this strategy to rid themselves of infection. The temperature that you feel when you get sick is your body's attempt to denature viral proteins. Hopefully the temperature doesn't get too high and end up denaturing you. Most proteins denature at 40 degrees Celsius. Higher temperatures are necessary to promote further physical changes. Adding acid to proteins, like the citric acid in lime juice, causes a change in their pH. The change in pH causes denaturation, very similarly to adding heat. Alternatively, proteins can be denatured through the physical force of stretching. This happens when you use a manual or an electric beater to whip eggs against the side of a bowl. When proteins denature, it opens up whole new opportunities for bonding. Protein chains become more likely to bond with one another and form a solid network. Water gets forced out from between the chains and a stronger, denser association is formed. The bonding of proteins into a solid mass is known as coagulation. In egg whites, the change from translucent to opaque is due to coagulation. So is the skin on the surface of curdled milk, or the increase in firmness of custard. I know this is getting a little technical, but remember, it's not just food, it's science. 
Okay, so let me um, follow up with a few comments. First of all, denaturation sounds like an overall bad thing, but remember cooking denatures protein and we can still use that denatured protein because what the body needs from protein are the amino acids, not the intact protein. And in fact, protein is denatured as part of digestion in the stomach due to the acid. The acid in the stomach denatures the protein so then the enzymes can do their work. It was also mentioned that um, the heat of a fever denatures viral proteins, helping um, you to stay well or to get well. When I had young children, my pediatrician told me, don't treat the low-grade fevers because that was actually helping my child. You want to have that slight rise in temperature, but a higher fever could be problematic. As the food scientist said, um, hopefully it won't get too high and end up denaturing you. And there is some truth to that because that can cause damage to the protein in tissues. So protein digestion begins in the stomach, and we talked about the importance of acid, but there are also enzymes there as well, continues in the small intestine. And you can see that um, most of the end product are the single amino acids, but in fact, some di and tripeptides are absorbed as well. Here is your protein concept map. This focuses more on the functions of protein, which we'll go through quickly. You can see there are quite a few of them and, and I will expect you to read about them in your textbook. So body structures may be what you would think about with regards to protein. And yes, protein is essential for body structures, but let's look at this question. Will eating protein in excess of requirements help this athlete build muscle mass? The answer is no. Okay, now this athlete may have or will have higher protein needs than a non-athlete, but once she's met them, the extra protein is used for fuel if needed, and if not, it is stored as fat, changed into fat. Protein's importance for, for maintaining fluid balance. Your liver produces proteins to keep in the bloodstream. Um, albumin is an example of that, and it holds fluid in. One of the signs that can occur with a certain type of malnutrition is that because there's not enough protein to make those blood proteins, fluid seeps out of the blood and into the tissues, which is edema. Protein is important as buffers for acid-base balance. Protein makes hormones. Insulin is only one example of a hormone that is a protein. Very important to understand, proteins contribute to immune function. When someone um, becomes compromised nutritionally, they also become prone to succumbing to infections they could typically fight off. So we see that about two thirds of the deaths of malnourished children are related to an illness because of a compromised immune system. Very important to note that protein is also a source of energy. And if you're starving, if you're not getting enough calories, your body will use not only dietary protein, but also body protein for energy. Um, and that's called wasting, of course. And um, protein even supplies energy in terms of an athlete or uh, someone who is healthy, but it's not the best source of calories. We would certainly prefer that protein is used for protein functions for a number of reasons as listed here. So this is kind of interesting. And when we go into unit three, there's more information on protein and its importance in weight management. But protein has the strongest impact on satiety and appetite control. So a diet that leans a little heavier in healthy proteins could be important for someone who is managing uh, their weight. Important to keep in mind. 
All right, so we always have a quick section on protein balance in the textbook. This is sometimes called nitrogen balance because nitrogen is used to follow what's happening to body proteins. When you're in a positive protein balance or a positive nitrogen imbalance, that indicates, that indicates that you are growing or you are adding to your proteins of your body, adding on to muscle, adding on to tissues, et cetera. If you're like me, you're probably in protein equilibrium, which means that you're maintaining your body proteins and what we don't want to see, but we do see in hospitalized patients, patients with um, starvation type eating disorders, patients who are starving because of other reasons, this is called a negative protein balance or negative nitrogen balance. And this means that you are using your own body proteins uh, to provide the amino acids you need for higher priority functions, but also to provide the calories that you need. So how much protein do you need? Well, 0 0.8 grams is not for this gentleman here, okay? 0 0.8 grams is for the average adult who is not stressed, is not ill, who is not building body mass. An athlete can uh, require up to double that amount. It's about 10% of total calories, and the AMDR is 10 to 35% of total calories. And you can see that most of us are meeting, if not exceeding, our protein requirements in this country. The protein recommendations do focus in on where we're supposed to get that protein from, and it should be seafood, leaner meats, and plant sources with less reliance on red meat and especially processed red meats. Using more plant-based proteins is very, very good for us. And be very um, observant to the protein intake of teen boys and adult men, because sometimes they actually need to cut back a bit in protein because they're over consuming by far their protein needs. There has been more attention paid recently to the distribution of protein throughout the meals. And it is important for our usage of that protein, for our digestion and absorption and metabolism to consume about 20 to 30 grams of protein at each meal. This has a positive effect on muscle protein synthesis, um, important not only for athletes, but for older individuals. And in fact, we see that older individuals should have at least 20 grams of protein per meal and require more protein than younger adults in order to stay in protein balance. As far as amino acid supplements, which are something that you can purchase, most dietitians advise to avoid them. The primary reason is that if you take too much of one, it can upset the balance of another, okay? So it throws off the balance. It's much better to get your proteins from food. Whey protein is acceptable for athletes. I would not suggest dabbling in amino acids unless you are working with a physician or a registered dietitian in using an amino acid for a specific uh, condition um, treatment of such. There is some research on certain amino acids for some mental health conditions, but again, be careful and be followed by an expert. All right, besides total protein, we also need to address protein quality. Protein quality refers to the mix of amino acids. Um, animal source foods are generally higher along with soy and quinoa. Plant proteins are usually lower, which means they're missing one or more of the essential amino acids. We know that protein 
is found in the different food groups, but certainly much higher in some groups than others, please note how low fruits are in protein. They are a healthy and important group to include in your diet, but they're not a great protein source. Now, we mentioned that plant proteins besides soy, besides um, quinoa, usually have a missing amino acid or two, making them lower quality. The way to get around that if you have a plant-based diet is to eat a variety of, of plant sources of protein and especially combine them in the same meal. This is called plant group combinations or complementary proteins. So something like beans and rice, though beans have missing amino acids, limiting amino acids, and rice has other essential amino acids that are limiting. Together, they make a complete protein. We'll talk more about that with regards to vegetarianism at the end of this lecture. We're not um, advising against plant sources of protein. Plant sources of protein are what we should be moving toward because they are so nutritious. Nutrients, phytochemicals, fiber, and protein, an excellent package. Animal proteins are certainly high quality, but the guidelines recommend that we consume less in the way of animal proteins, certainly much less processed red meat for sure. These sources can be high in saturated fats and low in beneficial substances. So the push is to lessen up on the animal proteins and include more plant proteins in your dietary pattern. Quick little look at food allergens. Food, a true food allergy is the immune system response to a protein in food. Uh, your immune system mistakenly believes it's a harmful invader. So we believe this occurs because of a leaky gut at some point in time, maybe um, in a young child whose GI tract hasn't fully matured, or maybe because of some GI illnesses that allow that food protein to move into the bloodstream before it's digested. Okay, so we are combining a, a the first couple of sections of chapter 16 into this lecture, just to bring awareness to the fact that malnutrition is far too common around the world and food insecurity far too common in this country. Malnutrition, of course, is poor nutrition and it can relate to under or over consumption. There are many different reasons for hunger and nutrition globally, and it's not an easy problem to fix, but there are a whole lot of organizations who are trying to address it. We see some stark examples of protein calorie malnutrition in children. Be sure to understand the difference between kwashiorkor and marasmus. Kwashiorkor is typically described as a lack of protein, but calories may be adequate or close to adequate. So we see edema, we see a fatty liver in these cases. The fatty liver, because although the liver makes fat, it cannot move fat away because of the lack of proteins to make lipoproteins. The edema, because those proteins are involved with keeping fluid in the the blood. Marasmus is starvation of both calories and protein. And of course, both of these forms of malnutrition can appear in adults. Okay, Quashiorca, not frequently, but marasmus, you will see. And they often come with a whole host of other nutrient deficiencies. Now, in the United States, our malnutrition looks different, but we have it sadly enough. Poverty is the root cause of malnutrition and that we could say that with global malnutrition as well. Food can be seen as optional when you look at rent, housing, uh, heat, 
medical costs. So this is something that falls to the wayside um, too frequently in impoverished families. Now we do have a number of programs to address food insecurity for sure. And we need to make sure our clients are aware of what they're eligible for. And in one of your discussions in this unit, you'll look into some of the other organizations that are attempting to help those who are food insecure in our own city of Philadelphia. It's a tough problem. It is a socio-ecological problem that often involves low wages, um, homelessness, um, you know, breakdown of families in some but not all cases. And you can see here how situational poverty is described. All of these factors can cause someone who was secure as far as their basic needs to become very insecure. All right, a uh, kind of major shift here to our last topic, and that is vegetarianism and, and veganism. There are many different reasons that people become vegetarians. And more recently, I see a lot of concern over the treatment of animals by our industrialized uh, farm and food system, but that is certainly not the only reason. When planned properly, a vegetarian diet is one of the healthiest diets out there because it's so plant-based. And you can see that here, all of the positives. Now, I would say if you're not ready to become a vegetarian, even moving toward a plant-based diet, but including some meat would do wonders health-wise. Some people say, well, I'll be vegetarian during the week. And then on the weekend, I'll, I'll allow myself to eat meat or Mondays will be a, a a meat-free day. There are all sorts of ways to push in this direction. Now, there are different types of vegetarians. Vegan eats only plant foods. Fruitarian is not a sound diet, by the way. You cannot eat only fruit, nuts, honey, and vegetable oils and expect to be healthy. But the other types of vegetarians listed um, certainly can be very healthy if planned properly. So making sure that you're not overly reliant on processed vegetarian foods, which come with some problems that all processed foods do, and making sure you're not sub substituting cheese and creams um, in this diet, which boosts up the saturated fat. So take a peek at this. Now, someone who is vegan, we have a few more concerns and you can see the nutrients listed there. And I will tell you that children can be healthy and vegan, but we watch their growth carefully since a vegan diet tends to be bulkier and therefore fill the individual or the child up more quickly. We want to make sure they get enough calories. This is a food plan for vegetarians based on my plate. So a minor kind of tweak to that gives a vegetarian the same type of principles regarding free, um, variety and moderation and nutrient density. All those things are still important. Okay, so thank you for tuning in and have a wonderful day.